All right. I'm going to uh, give it a minute, uh, let a few people join in. I know I'm doing an early morning uh, live stream here, uh, but... This is the time I've got. <laughs> so um, today's uh, live stream, it's going to be uh, morning with crypto or morning crypto. <laughs> so um, grab a cup of coffee if you've got one. Uh, if you're somewhere on the other side of the world and it's uh, five o'clock somewhere, grab a beer, grab a whiskey, grab a scotch. If you're coming back from the bar, uh, you're on the, uh, if you're on the West Coast, uh, you're three hours behind. I mean, there's a, a good chance uh, some some of you might be coming out of a club. So, anyhow, um, get a I got a couple people here uh, joining the uh, stream so far. Just gonna give it a minute. Then I'm gonna kick off. Um, we'll see how many people end up uh, joining on this morning. Good morning, uh, Pre Pro Tuck. Thank you for joining in. Nashcroft, good morning. Thanks for joining in. A little bit about coffee. Um, I'm not sure. We uh, we started out a while back on uh, on French press, and now uh, strictly espresso. I love espresso, and it, it's crazy what we go through to uh, to get good espresso. A friend of ours comes from uh, overseas uh, once every couple weeks. Um, and it's almost impossible to get Segfredo coffee here. It's an Italian uh, brand. Um, you can get it in different parts of the world. Obviously, you can get it over in Italy. And um, it's almost, again, almost impossible to source over here. I've checked everywhere to get it. And I did find one version of the Segfredo coffee. And the only one, the best one is in the black bag and you get it overseas. So he brings that over. So then we started looking around and we found Illy, Illy Espresso, which is also uh, phenomenal. So uh, if you guys get a chance to check out Illy Espresso Coffee, there's two versions. There's a red and a, and a black version. I think the, the black is the dark roast, much better than the uh, medium roast. So um, anyhow, I'm going to give it one more uh, cinnamon. <laughs> um, actually, I don't put cinnamon in my coffee. <laughs> uh, not in the espresso anyways. <laughs> so anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it off. Um, starting early morning like this, wasn't sure how many people we'd get on, uh, but those of you who are on, I think we're gonna have a, a great chat this morning. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, so let me uh, let me pull up some of my notes here that I put together. I want to try to stay on topic. Uh, my my goal is really to keep these two uh, 45 minutes and under. If I can hit that 30 minute mark. Uh, I'm not sure if that's possible. <laughs> so I've noticed a lot of the live streams go well over an hour, and I would like for people to have an opportunity to go back and, and re-watch these live streams um, after the fact. So um, Praxis Media Group. Yo, what's up, man? Hey, um, I've got... There, I've been having some issues with the uh, the OBS for uh, for the live stream, and I can't seem to put... Uh, a, a screen share on that I want to put on so I'm using a secondary uh, laptop over here to monitor the streams as they come through and I'm also monitoring the health of the stream I was getting a bit of delay the other day hey Charles what's going on all right we're getting some some people here so thank you guys all for tuning in this morning tuning into morning crypto um, planning on going live every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. so like I said earlier grab some coffee whatever your coffee of choice might be um, hopefully it's espresso because that's my favorite. So this morning I do have a number of uh, things that I want to cover. Um, the one thing that is for sure is that the financial world is shifting and it's shifting at a faster and faster pace right now. It's, it's really unbelievable uh, when you look at what's happening in the news and then you make some you can draw some conclusions about what's potentially happening behind the scenes. We've got some great uh, stuff happening at the at the government level um, but before I get into my topic of today and, and really what I want to talk about is digital the digital asset gold standard um, but holy shit I don't know if you guys saw what happened um, it was announced yesterday but this really started back in December um, a an exchange up in Canada uh, let me see. I pulled up this. I pulled up the article here uh, just to get it. Quadriga. What is it? Quadriga CX. Uh, 
$145 million uh, USD, which was $190 million Canadian dollars lost. Just gone. Uh, the, the owner, founder of this exchange uh, is over in India and he dies. And he took the password with him. I mean, the one thing that we uh, that we all talk about is securing your own digital asset. Um, we talk about using a ledger. I mean, what a what an amazing ad for having a ledger and keeping uh, control of your own digital assets. Um, really unbelievable. I couldn't believe I'm reading this article. Um, this was on February one, uh, so I guess that was yesterday. So I sometimes lose track of time, but. I can't believe it. I mean, this is the exchange itself in terms of liquidity at this point has the equivalent of $286,000. They misplaced, uh, uh, here it is. It owes uh, 260 million Canadian, so 198 million, $198 million that is lost. It has nothing to do with hacking. It has everything to do with the owner and the founder of this exchange dying i mean that this is unbelievable and there was no backup plan i mean that is to me I, you know it's just astonishing i can't believe it um and then i i look and you think about it and you think about the exchanges that you're keeping your digital assets on what's even more astonishing and i'm looking in this article i don't see it specifically in this article um but they said it was a combination of fiat currency as well as digital asset um that is just gone lost and the wife has been going through they found his computer and his computer's encrypted and so there's no access to his computer, no backup plan on codes. You would think they would put a backup plan, some contingency. Uh, but this really shows, you know, you can't have faith uh, in, in these exchanges. You know, something like this happens. I, I believe that, you know, there are some, if you look at like a Binance, uh, if you look at, you know, there's obviously some negativity that goes around uh, the, the word uh, Coinbase. Uh, but if you look at Coinbase, if you look at Uphold, uh, there are some major exchanges. Gemini, you would anticipate, you would make an assumption that these large exchanges have some sort of a contingency plan if their CEO uh, all of a sudden disappears one day. If they're, let's say, a CEO of one of these exchanges gets kidnapped. In this situation, Quadri Quadriga CX uh, gone everything just wiped out not no no hacking the owner the founder simply just dies and takes the secrets with him i mean that is unbelievable i mean i just i can't get over that fact you know and so i really think you know every day that i that i've uh that i decided to get a ledger um i have two ledgers now move digital assets off onto them um and so uh, <laughs> I just I can't say enough about that. That is just when I read that yesterday, I was just like, oh, my God, that's insane. Absolutely insane. I couldn't imagine being one of those guys up in Canada and thinking, hey, all my digital assets safe. But even to keep fiat currency on that exchange, I mean, uh, I, I just it's just gut wrenching to see something like that happen. Then yesterday, there was also an announcement that. Uh, that banks over primarily over in Europe are being hacked via the two-step uh, authentication via cell phones via mobile the mobile app there's an open uh, back door on on the mobile phones on the mobile phone networks that's allowing uh, individuals hackers to get into banks so you think your bank accounts are safe and your cash is safe granted it, in that scenario um, as they're emptying out bank accounts um, not, I'm not talking about digital assets, um, but they're emptying out bank accounts because they found a backdoor to mobile two-step authentication to gain access to people's banks. Uh, and it's primarily over in Europe. It's not happening in the U.S. Uh, we don't have that. I don't believe we have that same uh, issue, but that backdoor was put in so the governments can then monitor what's happening uh, transaction-wise. Um, now, they, they try to, uh, and this is one of the, one of the, the areas that uh, you see, I want to call it FUD in the media, uh, negativity against uh, digital assets, and they, and they single out uh, the hacking of, of certain exchanges. But here we are, we have banks that are being, bank accounts being emptied out. Um, be and, and again using just standard uh, mobile application you know and and bypassing this two-step authentication process and emptying out cash out of a bank account 
yet again. You know, that, that's just insane to me. Um, stuff like that's happening. Uh, more good news, though. Another uh, news tidbit here. More good news that came out um, on the 31st, I believe. Um, there were two more uh, bills that were sponsored. I thought I pulled this up here. Um, two, two more bills sponsored by Democrat uh, Republican Darren Soto of Florida uh, and was co-sponsored by two Republicans. Uh, let me pull that up real quick. Hang on one second. I'm going to type that in here. Let me just look it up. Uh, let's see. It was HR 922 uh, in the 116th Congress. If you look up the, the wrong con uh, congressional uh, session, you're going to get the wrong information. Uh, but here it is. So, uh, H.R. 922, there were two bills that were just uh, proposed uh, by Darren Soto, by Congressman Darren Soto. Um, I sent out a little uh, congratulation to him uh, the other day for introducing these because it's so important. Uh, and so uh, CKJ brought this up on, on his uh, stream the other night. Uh, but what's, what's great about the bills that we see uh, uh, Congressman Soto introducing. And, you know, he's a Democrat. Um, we see Warren Davidson uh, over in, uh, in Ohio also going the bipartisan route. Cryptocurrencies, digital assets, blockchain technology, uh, keeping it in the U.S., is a bipartisan issue. This is a revolutionary technology that has to, the U.S. has to stay ahead of the game. Uh, we led the, the industry when it came to, uh, when it came to uh, the internet revolution. Uh, the, there's no reason why the U.S. shouldn't be a leader uh, in the blockchain uh, technology uh, revolution. And so the, the Congress and right now is really standing in the way of progress uh, for the U.S. to continue uh, being a leader and to continue being competitive. But here's uh, Darren Soto, um, and he, by, uh, it was a, a bipartisan uh, bill uh, sponsored by, um, let's see here, we've got uh, uh, Ted Budd, a Republican out of North Carolina. Uh, we have a co-sponsor with Warren Davidson out of Ohio, and we have a co another co-sponsor, another Democrat out of New Jersey, uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman. And so this was introduced on the 30th, uh, and so this is just fantastic. So um, this the, the topic of H.R. 922 to promote fair and transparent virtual currency markets by examining the potential for price manipulation. Um, and then if we pull up 933, uh, let's look up HR 933. Um, this also a very important topic. Um, so let's see. Let's see if it came up. Uh, what did I type in? 933, 116th. Um, hmm. All right. Let me look here. Hang on one second. We just type it in the browser. So I'm going to look up HR 933 in the 116th. I meant to pull this up ahead of time before the uh, stream started. Uh, let me look over who else joined in. Attila Budai from Hungary. I love when I see people from other parts of the world uh, logging in, joining in. Uh, Hungary is a place I haven't been yet. Um, I haven't traveled much into Eastern Europe, but I've uh, been pretty much uh, everywhere else. So welcome from Hungary. All right, so let's see. HR 933. Let's see what we've got here. Um, this this one I think is important. Um, nope, this is not the one. Uh, not 933. That's my problem. It's 923. All right, let me uh, let me redo this one because we had 922 and 923, not 933. All right, let me go back here. Here we go. 923. I wish I I was sharing this uh, screen. If you guys go to Congress.gov. Um, and you can look up all the different bills and, and do some research on them. But the 923 is is really the the important bill um, that they're that they're uh, that they introduced, um, sponsored by. And this one had a, a slightly different uh, co-sponsor base. But this is to promote United States competitiveness in the evolving global virtual currency marketplace. I think 923 is probably one of the more important bills because this is basically saying. We got to get our act together. If we don't get our act together now, uh, it's going to be way too late. So uh, Darren Soto, 
uh, co-sponsors with three Republicans, uh, Ted Budd of North Carolina, Warren Davidson, again, uh, from Ohio, and Tom Emmer uh, from Minnesota, Republican. And Tom Emmer just introduced a bill um, a couple weeks ago as well. So things are picking up, which is fantastic. You know, I'd love to see uh, some some progress being made at the congressional level. It, it's so critical. Um, and so let me let me take a look here, take a little pause, get some more people logging in or commenting. Um, yeah, again, yeah, would love to uh, visit uh, South End on Sea England. Uh, love my stream. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, Northern Michigan. I used to live up in the Detroit area. So Chewy uh, 1358. That's awesome. Uh, what part of Northern Michigan? South Carolina. Fantastic. In there, <laughs> love South Carolina. Um, all right, Southern. Eng I love England. I've, I've been all throughout the UK. Uh, my favorite place. I love going over to Ireland. Uh, been throughout Scotland. Been all throughout England. Uh, fantastic place. I haven't been to Wales yet, though. Um, Attila, very good topics. I appreciate that. I, I really try to stay on interesting topics. It's you know I try to avoid fluff. Um, you know, that, that always, uh, kind of bothers me a little bit when, you know, you go on, you want to watch something important, watch something interesting, learn something new. Um, and then it's just a bunch of fluff and, and really you don't get much out of it. So I'm trying to do my best introducing and, you know, hopefully, uh, the people appreciate it. So I'm glad to hear that you guys appreciate that. Southampton, UK. Fantastic. Fantastic. So this is great. I love seeing again. I love seeing the uh, the international uh, uh, viewership. That's fantastic. Um, anybody from India, let me know. Um, been over there as well. Been all throughout India. Uh, a lot of great things happening there. Uh, India, even though they're they're, you know, it, I think we've seen some stuff in the news over in India that. Um, and and I made a video on this a while back. I don't know. Why I'm kind of sidetracking on India. Uh, but I believe that India could really make a huge impact uh, in the blockchain and the digital asset space. And if there's any country in the world uh, that can benefit uh, from this technology and benefit from uh, digital assets and benefit from a revitalization uh, or a, a, a burgeoning of their of their economy at the lowest levels, uh, India is it, and India's, India's made some really interesting uh, changes uh, when it comes to digitizing their own currency and removing fiat currency out of the market. And this, I can't. I have to go back and see uh, the video that I had made on it. How you know when it was exactly? But they had removed like seventy-five percent of all their fiat currency uh, from the market. And there was a huge population over there. It was uh, like one point three billion people, and about seven hundred million of them live in absolute poverty. Um, and then there's this upper class, which is like 200, 200 million people in India live in this upper class. I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, the, the size of the U.S. is what, like 330 million and almost the entire size of the U.S. is an upper class, wealthy class over in India. Then you have a growing middle class that's just booming over there. And then you have this impoverished class that's it's like 700 million people. I mean, it's astonishing. And when you go over there and you see the poverty, but these are the people that relied on fiat day to day. They can't even afford to open a bank account, let alone did they trust the government enough to open the bank account, but the fees would kill them because you know, we're talking about people that make maybe, you know, the equivalent. If they're an engineer, they're college educated, they might make $200 a month. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable over there. Lava, what is that? Lavazza espresso. I think I've had that before too. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, I've been focusing on the Illy now. Now that I found a source for Illy, I went to. They have a a cafe over here, an Illy cafe. I, it, in the Detroit airport, there's an Illy. Downtown over here, there's an Illy. Um, now near the house, uh, they opened up a, a, an Illy, and I started seeing Illy popping up all over the place. Typically, over in Europe, uh, you get the Illy coffee. Um, now I found it on Amazon, and I hope it's real because. Uh, but anyhow, it's good stuff. All right. So sorry, I sidetracked into, uh, into India, but, uh, another, another, uh, news item that just came out and this is to me, this is, really is super, super meaningful. Um, the other day I, I put together a video on what's happening at the state level 
Um, and so Wyoming had proposed a bill um, a couple days or a couple weeks ago, I think it was uh, second week of January, uh, to recognize digital assets as money. And January 31st, so we're talking about a couple days ago, Wyoming is going down in U.S. economic history. So our our children or their children, when they go back into reading in the history books, they're going to see that Wyoming, which is crazy, you know, you think about it, what else, you know, you don't hear about Wyoming in the news too much, uh, but here's Wyoming recognizing, with, I believe it's the first state uh, to truly recognize digital assets as money. Um, we talked about uh, Nevada the other day, um, what Nevada has done uh, to, to uh, uh, cut out taxes on anything to do with blockchain digital asset um, so and and making their state more friendly the state at the state level we're seeing a tremendous amount of competition uh, to attract this technology and attract companies that are developing this technology so the state level we got to keep our eyes on the state level the states uh, have the power uh, to do and to and to uh, create uh, their own um, their own regulations uh, over the digital asset space. Um, obviously, the Fed uh, can the Fed is the only one that can coin money. Um, but here we are. We have Ohio uh, that is now allowing the acceptance of Bitcoin uh, to pay taxes. Um, that was that was tremendous. You know the fact that Ohio was the first uh, to do that. Nevada, I think this. In, the dates are slipping out, but I think it was in 2017. And then uh, when they started initiating uh, some of their, their friendly uh, space for, for blockchain and digital assets, they want to attract the companies uh, to Nevada. In Nevada, uh, there's a, a, a multi-billionaire over there that, that bought up uh, so whatever amount of uh, space to create a blockchain town, uh, which is unbelievable. And they're going to start construction on that. Wyoming is going the direction of a multa uh, but here in the U.S., so if we see Malta is super uh, blockchain friendly and companies are moving from all over the world to go to Malta, we saw the Marshall Islands uh, is now accepting a digital asset. They have a digital currency that's sitting side by side with the U.S. dollar because they want to decrease the reliance on the on the fiat. And the IMF was speaking out against that. But here, but here in the in the U.S., we're we're bogged down by the lack of SEC SEC clarity. We're bogged down by the fact that Congress hasn't taken the initiative to vote on the proposed bills. But we're seeing these the bills coming from multiple different directions, as we just talked about with Darren Soto and soon Warren Davidson will reintroduce uh, the token taxonomy bill. He has not reintroduced it yet, um, but when they do, it's going to have some modification. Uh, and it will probably have a different name, I would assume, uh, because the token taxonomy was for the 115th uh, Congress, and now we're in the 116th uh, session. So um, we definitely should see some some great things happening over there. Uh, let me take a look over here. Um, sorry again, I got to look at at the other uh, the other screen. Uh, Nashcroft over in Texas, man, Texas is awesome too. I love going to Texas. Uh, that's one area that we had actually. Uh, planned on moving to at one point, um, been there, uh, Houston, uh, Austin, um, been to Austin multiple times. Um, a great place. Definitely love it over there. Um, Julianne from the UK. Um, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to focus. Let me, if you guys have any questions as I go through this, I'm going to get into my topic here in a minute. Um, and then I guess we're already at like 25 minutes. Um, I said I wanted to try to keep these to 45. Uh, we'll see. We'll see where the the time goes. It definitely no more than an hour. I definitely want to cut it cut it off at that point. Um, but let's see. Um, there was a question. Where did it go? Here we go. Okay, Julian. Um, what's keeping the Ripple price suppressed? Now I covered this the other day um, on on a video. I've talked about this in the past on videos. Uh, in my opinion, um, and it's strictly based on my own opinion. Uh, observing the marketplace, but I believe that the price of XRP is going to increase as we see an increase in actual utility of XRP. So news and price 
really don't coincide with one another. So if we're talking about Amazon, Google, Facebook, or General Electric, GE, or GM, or whatever it might be, we're talking about a, a corporation with a stock, as negative news comes out on the company, the stock price will most likely reflect the positive or negative news. Um, and so we see a lot, you know, we talk about manipulation of the market, manipulation of pricing, right? There's a lot of talk about manipulation of the pricing on digital assets, uh, but there is 100% uh, a concerted effort. And this is my opinion, and this is through observing. Uh, my wife was investing, uh, you know, quite a bit also, and, and she kept telling me that this was what would happen. I said, no, that, that's not it. And I would... I was monitoring everything, but you know, when, when you go in and trade and, and you see the media and you and, and the media FUD, the, the media FOMO, whatever it is, pro, con, by the time something positive hits the media, like a Jim Cramer show, um, by the time he's talking about it, you need to be out of it because it's too late. Uh, everything had already happened uh, with whatever that stock is. If there's negative media attention, look at General Motors right now. I'm, I have not even invested in General Motors uh, anymore. But if we look at their share price on Monday and yesterday they announced they're laying off 4,000 people, um, almost guaranteed that their price point should go down. There'll be some negative uh, impact on, on, their, on their stock. Look what happened to GE. GE uh, took, a, took a nosedive. I mean, their business is a disaster right now. Um, their stock price went down considerably, but then... Uh, um, Thursday, uh, the GE stock went up by 11, 12 percent uh, because there was some positive news. So I guess my point here is positive news, negative news is going to impact a stock. But when it comes to XRP, XRP is not a stock. It's not a security. Um, you're not invested in XRP with the expectation that as as news and good things happen with Ripple, that XRP is going to reflect a positive or a negative uh, price impact as a result of the positive or negative news that is reflected within Ripple. So I think that's that's the differentiator. And if they were tied together, um, then at that point there would be it would be more evident. And this I think you know if you go back to the Howey test as well, and we talked about that on a video the other day. But at that point, XRP would be a security because there would be an expectation that as good things happen within Ripple, that we're expecting a, a, uh, a percentage of that increase. And that percentage would then be given through uh, XRP, a, a, an increase in the value of, of XRP. Now, the expectation of increase of the value of XRP, and again, this is my opinion, so take it for what it's worth. Um, you guys can do your own research and figure it out, but uh, XRP should increase uh, in value as more banks begin to use XRapid, when more companies begin to use XRP. Um, we just saw the tie up uh, with Swift and R3. Who knows how long it's going to take for them to roll that out? Is it a year? Is it two years? Um, I don't know how long it's going to take for a full implementation of, of software in, in an organization like Swift. Uh, when we talk about you know implementations and rollouts, you know for them to use uh, that that solution. But what we do know is that with uh, with that uh, tie up, Swift will inevitably. Uh, be using XRP as the solution through R3 because we know R3 through Corda is using XRP and, and it was the first primary digital asset that they're that they're tying into into that into that platform. So obviously there's other solutions out there. There's other options, other digital asset options. But what we knew, and I, I talked about this the other night, um, and and I talked about it also on another video, kind of one coin. Uh, one use case um, but the point here is that xrp was designed it was developed uh, with the intent of being a solution for cross-border payments and and mega sized cross-border payments we're not talking about micro payments that wasn't the concept of its development was to allow banks to move large sums of money within seconds and they talk about what three seconds uh, you can move millions upon millions of dollars that's the power of, of xrp Swift knows it. The world knows it. The banks know it. Everybody knows the power of XRP. But getting to your point there uh, is 
is or, or when will XRP increase in value, it's a matter of adoption and utility. Uh, once it, be, it is used, the value is going to go up based on scarcity of availability, based on the requirement and the need of liquidity uh, by these banks. And that's, again, the premise of XRP is, is, is a solution uh, for liquidity, but also as a solution for settlement. So if we're moving these large sums of money and we're talking about what, what is it? You know, I, I forget the exact number. Was it $5 trillion a day are moved in cross-border payments? So if XRB becomes the epicenter of these cross-border payments, who knows where the value and the price point can go? It could go, we saw all sorts of people uh, talking about uh, numbers last year, the 589s and all of that. That we have other people talking about the potential of it exceeding. It could go to a thousand dollars. It could go to two thousand dollars. Who knows? Maybe it'll stay at thirty cents. Maybe it'll go to a dollar. Um, I, I don't know if we, if anybody really knows at this point, especially on our side, that the guys over at, at Ripple have a, an expectation of where it's going to go. I'm sure they do. Um, do the banks have an expectation of where the value is going to go? I'm sure those guys do as well. Um, at the government level, I'm positive behind the door, you know, behind behind closed doors, they're they're talking about it. They they have a, a, a an idea of the direction of where the digital assets can go. Um, so, you know, so that so that's kind of that take on it. Let me take a, a second here. Let me look here. Um, let's see. Where's my, uh, there we go. Keep buying this, um, trying to go back up, sorry. Donegal, Ireland, Lisa Flanagan. I think I've been through Donegal. I love going over to, uh, to Ireland. That place is awesome. I, I love going to Glendalock. I did an accidental hike one time uh, through Glendalock, through the mountains over there. It was uh, not intentional, but uh, uh, we were driving uh, from Dublin, coming back over from, uh, from Germany, and we decided to do a couple days stop over in Ireland, drink in Dublin, drive around a little bit, and I was with a coworker, and uh, we said, hey, let's uh, just drive and, and see what we can see, and we ended up at, at Glendalock, and um, then we started walking, looking for some views, and both of us are... are in good shape he's a marathon runner i run a lot i work out a lot but anyhow so we ended up hiking up this the, the mountain up there we're seeing people coming down the mountain with their backpacks and hiking gear and they're looking at us they have maps and they're looking at us like we're, we're kind of crazy we ended up doing this i don't know it's like a three hour mountain hike all the way around and people were struggling we kind of ran through this the hike but it was unbelievable I love going there, and uh, my wife, son, and I, we go over to Ireland every every chance we get. I love it. It's an absolutely fantastic place. Uh, Damas over in Melbourne, Australia. Haven't been to Australia yet, but uh, I heard it's a phenomenal place. Was that? Germanistan. Butter, uh, butterfly Trader. Let's see. I'm just going to scroll through, uh, see what, what we have here. Uh, why isn't there utility yet? That's another good question. Uh, but utility is coming. I think it, everything takes time. Yeah, if you look at the rollout of, of anything, you want to roll out of software, roll out of whatever it might be. You know, we're, we're talking about a, a change, complete change. I mean, it's again, it's a revolutionary uh, change, even for the banks. Uh, to move away from a SWIFT and to go into a digital asset based uh, solution, um, I think is is monumental. And I think we're going to start seeing utility. It's it's happening around the world. Um, so let me uh, shoot these uh, Q and A's coming through here. I'm going to try to get back to it here in a second. Um, so let me let me uh, move on. I want to try to stay a little bit focused on point here. Um, let's see here. Okay, so. So we talked about Wyoming. We got into uh, some sidetrack a little bit on XRP, which is awesome. Uh, now, digital assets in general uh, are really moving uh, towards global adoption at the highest level. So we're, we're talking about XRP. We're talking about what's happening with the banks. Now, Wyoming is just recognizing digital assets as money. Japan and Germany have already recognized 
digital assets as money. You know, so we're seeing nations and these are leading nations, right? Germany is is the leader, the economic leader of Europe. Japan has always been the economic leader of Asia, although we see where China is going now. China is a powerhouse. Uh, India can be a powerhouse. Uh, but here's two major uh, countries that have already recognized digital assets as money. So, hey, if you, if you guys are just uh, tuning in, um, my name is Jeff uh, with the HODL Report. Um, this, uh, this stream, I'm going to be doing this live stream, Morning Crypto, every Saturday at 8 a.m. Um, I think it's a great time. So, anyhow, so let, let me uh, turn towards the topic of today, and then I'm going to get back into... Uh, and I'll get back into the chats. So I just picked up someone's drinking a uh, Newcastle. Newcastle is great. Jade. <laughs> At that time of day already, I was thinking yeah, a little bit of, uh, of uh, Jameson or something in the coffee would have been good. A little bit too early. We we're at the Irish pub last night uh, drinking uh, Teeling small batch uh, with, with Guinness. And that was really good. So, all right. Um, let me see here. So really the topic of today. And so if, if I can you know, get back into that a new gold standard in the making uh, right and so this is really again we we're looking at the globalization of digital assets uh we're looking at where xrp and bitcoin uh are going uh the feedback at the at the national level at the at the largest uh the the at the within the largest organizations uh those who control the economics, the banking, et cetera. Um, but th to, this is my opinion. I, I, I firmly believe that these two primary digital assets are really in line right now to completely disrupt uh, global fiat. And I also believe that these two digital assets are going to be center stage, at least for right now. And, and, and the reason why I can say that, if you look at What's happening like in Ohio, they're accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment uh, for taxes, although it goes to another exchange. I brought that up and there's so much discussion over Bitcoin. Um, so so as governments transition to accepting digital assets, uh, you know, again, a method of payment like Ohio for taxes, Wyoming as a currency uh, or a recognized currency. Uh, we have the Marshall Islands that has their own currency. We just saw another stable coin the other day that was pegged to uh, Bitcoin, not pegged to a fiat currency. Uh, now, potentially, uh, the Fed recognizing or the uh, government recognizing a new gold standard for the U.S. dollar fiat. Now, you know, I, I don't want to discount any other the potential of any other digital assets or blockchain technologies. I really want to focus in on two of the most current globally accepted uh, uh, digital assets with really at this point the most adoption potential. Now, it might be a little bit crazy to talk about um, digital assets as a gold standard, uh, but I think if we look back, uh, there is... So an argument to be made that digital assets are really the perfect uh, solution uh, to recreate a gold standard, not just for the U.S. dollar, uh, but for currencies around the world. So if we look at today's fiat, right, the U.S. dollar, as most other currencies around the world, aren't really backed by anything other than a promissory note that's issued by the government and accepted by the public as a note of value. So if we take a dollar bill, uh, I'm accepting that dollar bill because it's, uh, you know, it's a promissory note by the government that it has a value, but I accept the value and the person at the store or the individual I'm giving it to also has to accept the value of that note as a dollar uh, for goods exchange. But there's nothing else backing it up. It's basically just paper. And I'm saying this has value for whatever goods. If you're gonna sell me a bottle of water, my dollar is now worth that bottle of water. And from your perspective, you're selling me the water, then you're also seeing that same value. Now, the gold standard, which was dropped by the US years and years ago, back in 1973, which pegged the value uh, of the dollar uh, to, to gold at that time, right? That was the gold standard. Um, and it was based on X amount of value uh, or weight of gold, um, 
was valued at whatever amount of US dollar. Let's say it was 1600 uh, US dollars per whatever ounce of gold. Now, when it comes to, uh, to this, this topic, so the question uh, that I wanna throw out there, and to me that I think this, it's an interesting question to talk about, uh, which is really my topic. Now, XRP and Bitcoin as a gold standard for a new economy, should the US return to a gold standard should other countries return to this quote unquote gold standard um but when it when it comes to actually returning to um the gold standard should it be a gold-backed us dollar or should it be a digital asset gold standard now when we look at this argument there's there's really uh there's two parties uh in this argument there's those that are opposed to returning to the gold standard, and there's those that are in favor of returning to the gold standard. Those in favor, um, there's some really important people in government and in business that believe that returning to the gold standard is important. Um, those that are opposed to it claim that there's not enough gold in the U.S. holdings to support the U.S. dollar, to cover all current global transactions, pegging the value of U.S. dollar to gold uh, held uh, could limit the U.S. government aid in, in adding liquidity to the market in times of financial instability. Um, there's all these different arguments opposed. Makes sense. All right. Now, gold, although limited in, in quantity, you can only hold so much, um, but then you have to stake a value to it. It's not transferable. It's not movable. Um, there's all these other things that go on with, with gold and, in terms of how to to maintain it, et cetera. Um, but, but that's why we're gonna talk about the digital asset gold standard. So those that are in favor of return to the gold standard, a state that pegging the US dollar to a gold standard would limit the runaway nonchalant printing of fiat. So over the years, that's what the governments do. Oh, we need more money, let's print more money. All right, so now you print more money, there's more money available, the value of it is intrinsically less because now you have more of it. Now it doesn't make any sense. So the inflation on the cost of goods, is this bottle of water, is this bottle of water more valuable today than it was 10 years ago? It's the same bottle of water. You know, why does it now cost me more money uh, to buy this bottle of water than it did 10 years ago? Why is it that I could have bought this for 50 cents? Now it costs me a buck 50. You know, and so that has to do with really the rampant uh, and, and, and the non, as, as I just read, the nonchalant printing of fiat to make up for economic woes. And that, that's these, these, you know, those, those within government. And for years, it's been mostly attorneys that, had, that run Congress, that run for Congress, that get into political office, that get elected. Uh, they go to Senate. The majority of them are attorneys. If I'm going to get my uh, preparing my taxes or if I want investing advice, the last person in the world that I'm going to go to for economic advice is an attorney. I'm going to go to a CPA. I'm going to go to someone that understands stocks. I'm going to go to someone that understands money. Uh, but I'm not going to go to the attorney to get financial advice. Same way, I'm not going to go to the financial guy to get legal advice. But why in the world are we electing attorneys to make decisions on economic things that impact our economy. It's unbelievable. And they sit up there and they talk, then they listen to their experts, and then they make their decisions. But what are their decisions made on? Their thought process, if you go to law school and you study law, your thought process is completely different than those who study money, those who invest, those who create, business owners. And there, there's some attorneys out there that could be phenomenal business owners. It's like taking a doctor. I'm not going to go to a doctor and get economic advice. There's some doctors that are phenomenal business guys. There's quite a few doctors that have no clue about business whatsoever. You know, so, so it's just amazing to me. So anyhow, so those in favor, again, return to the gold standard, pegging the U.S. dollar to this gold standard, would limit the runaway nonchalant printing of fiat, uh, which they argue will also inevitably lead to rampant inflation and undermine the stability of the U.S. financial system. So again, this bottle of water, 
10 years ago, maybe I could buy it for 50 cents. Today, it's going to cost me a buck 50. That's because of the mismanagement of the economy at the highest levels uh, in government and, and their idea to solve all the woes uh, by printing more money. Or what's their other solution? Let's tax everybody. Let's, let's take more money out of your pocket. Right now, you pay 35% tax. 45% tax on your invest on your uh, on on your income. Then you have property tax. Then you have sales tax. Then you have use tax. Then there's tax for your cell phone bill. Then there's tax for your for your cable bill. Then there's uh, fees uh, to register your car. And then there's there's so many taxes. If we really break it down and we look at how much money is taken by the government in terms of taxes, it far exceeds what you're paying on your income. It's unbelievable. And yet they want to take more money. You see the arguments right now in Congress and some of these freshman uh, congresswomen that are calling for 90% tax on wealthy. Where in the world do they think the jobs are made? What do they think these wealthy people do with their disposable income? Do they keep it in a bank account? Should it be redistributed? These people that are at the top are going out there and buying ridiculous things. They might buy ridiculous real estate. They buy ridiculous commercial buildings that are rented back out to help people uh, uh, work, put people to work. They help people uh, invest in new businesses. That's where all this money goes. It doesn't just sit in a bank account. I mean, that's insane. That's absolutely insane. The more you see these people on the, on the left that are moving this country into fascism and socialism and yet accusing those on the right that believe in, an, in a limited government, in limited taxation, let the people keep their money. If I want to invest in digital assets and I want to make money from digital assets, what businesses of, of others to then tax me every single time I make a transaction with a digital asset? What did I just do? I created money, but why in the world does anybody deserve a percentage of what I just made? That makes absolutely no sense. And it's not, and the government's not backed up anything because their way of making more money is taking our money in, form, in the form of taxes or they print more money. It, it, just, it just makes no sense. Now, this entire topic, my thought process on this came out of reading an article and I read this years ago. Um, and it just stayed in my mind for so many years. Um, so if you follow Steve Forbes, uh, you guys probably know who Steve Forbes is, right? So Steve Forbes, uh, this guy is absolutely amazing. Uh, he ran for president a couple times. Um, the guy, he, he runs Forbes magazine. The guy's got, uh, economically, this guy knows what he's talking about, right? He, there was an interesting interview in, from 2012, so seven years ago, uh, Steve Forbes was, was interviewed discussing specifically going back to the gold standard, should it happen, could it happen? Uh, and, and his point is that, yes, this is exactly what we should do. So I wanna, I'm gonna read through this. We're already now, sorry, man, I, got, I kind of ran away with everything. Now we're at the 50 minute mark. Um, I might be going a little bit longer than I anticipated here, uh, but that, that, that's how it goes when you, when you get on a rant. I'm going to try to minimize my rant so that I respect everybody's time as well. We got some you know, great comments coming through here. Um, I'm going to try to go back and, and respond. Man, Rob Cash, thanks for showing up. If you guys uh, tune in, I know uh, Rob has been super busy uh, working. Uh, but man, your show is awesome. If you guys haven't tuned in to his YouTube channel, uh, tune in to see Rob Cash. Awesome, awesome stuff that he talks about. Uh, super fired up and motivated uh, on XRP. So um, like I said, I'm going to try to go back up through here and, and respond. But let, let me get back in, into this. What I'm going to do, I'm going to dissect this interview a little bit. Um, I'm going to try to wrap things up here, hopefully in uh, like 15, 20. Um, but so let's see here, um, go back to, I'm trying to stay back on topic. Um, so so the, the point here is Steve Forbes in this interview is talking about a return to the gold standard. There's others in government, others in, in economics that believe that we need to return to this gold standard. Now, if it does happen, what about a digital gold standard as I just mentioned earlier on? Could it be based on pegging the US dollar 
to XRP, to Bitcoin, or maybe even a basket of digital assets. So we're not uh, relying and, and putting uh, our national security at stake by any form of manipulation of other players uh, within uh, that space. But as a country, imagine the amount of digital asset that they would that we would need to accumulate and hold and the value thereof uh, for these individual digital assets would be phenomenal right and and the the and at the end of the day though we'd be securing our currency our national currency based on something that is truly limited in quantity gold is never limited in quantity because you can keep mining gold there's gold all over the world. Um, and then there's the fight and the control. And we see countries that are attempting to amass gold again, uh, like Russia and, and China and, uh, and others. Um, but let's make take a move uh, into the digital asset gold standard. Now, really think about all of this while we review the article. So again, this was um, published, let's see, July 2012. Uh, the writer, Ron Hera, uh, the title of this article was Steve Forbes, How to Bring Back America. Now, I don't like going through and just reading articles, uh, but this article is so important. You guys can look it up. You can read through it as well. I'm going to read through parts of it. I want to dissect it. I want to comment a little bit on it. Um, but again, uh, Steve Forbes, you know, who is Steve Forbes? Uh, so let's just do a quick recap. Editor-in-chief of Forbes magazine. Again, uh, Republican presidential candidate in 1996 and 2000. Uh, when he was at Princeton, he was the founder of Business Today magazine, which is the largest business magazine with, with uh, student writers uh, in the country. Uh, he served in the Reagan administration. He supported many political candidates over the years, and he's a huge supporter and proponent of the flat tax. And that could be a completely different video that uh, that we can have and and discuss. Um, I am planning a uh, planning on a video uh, based on flat tax. Um, I've had people present on flat tax before, and it's it's actually it's pretty it's pretty uh, astonishing. So um, now again the hair. So here this is Hera Research newsletter. Um, let me let me read some snippets here, um, and then let's let's dissect a little bit. So let's see. Um, what's the time here? We're almost at nine. All right. Uh, so they start off. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, with the U.S. economy struggling to recover from recession and financial crisis, what policies would you recommend? Again, this is Hera Research Act, uh, asking Steve Forbes. So Steve Forbes response. And this is great. This is the financial crisis. This is as we were coming out of uh, the, the economic uh, collapse really globally. Um, so Steve Forbes says the only way to recover is to stabilize our money, have a gold backed dollar, simplified tax code and a return to a free market. 100% right on the money. Unbelievable. So so the, the, the follow up question then is you advocate the gold standard. That was Hera. Steve Forbes says if there's any better system to ensure a stable value of money, it's yet to be found. What Steve Forbes didn't realize in 2012, hang on one second. What Steve Forbes didn't realize in 2012 is that the other system was founded already. The other system was in development. It was an incubator stage. Bitcoin, the beginning of digital assets, 100% was starting at that time. 2010, the initiation of the digital asset revolution um, that had started at that point. Now we're in 2012. Steve Forbes wasn't aware of it, or if he was, uh, but if there's any better system to ensure a stable value for money. So he again, he wasn't looking. Uh, Forbes statement is so relevant. Now there is a better system, a much better system than the gold standard, and that is and that is a system that's backed by a digital asset gold standard. Now, choosing the right digital asset, again, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a, uh, a store of value. 
Uh, there can be some argument against a mine coin that can be easily manipulated uh, by foreign holders, by foreign miners. We know that the majority of the miners are over in China. However, once you accumulate a certain amount of Bitcoin that is out there, then now you control, uh, you basically control that, that value of, of Bitcoin. Um, now, if it's divided out, the values go up. The government, if they were to back it with a Bitcoin, let's say, there would have to be, obviously, the, the guys are much smarter than I am on figuring out the balance of what you would have to hold versus value. And then you would actually be able to push towards setting a value somehow um, based on based on holding and trading, et cetera. XRP, the same thing. Um, so it doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be a one for one. Obviously, uh, XRP, which is decentralized, uh, XRP is in significant abundance. XRP is easy to hold and quickly exchangeable. XRP value doesn't have to be one to one. So the value of XRP could be allowed to breathe and, and grow uh, under this digital gold standard. Now, Forbes continues. For nearly all of America's first 200 years, the dollar was linked to gold. Since we went off the gold standard, we've had more and more financial, economic, and banking crises. That's 100% spot on. And, and we, talked, uh, we just were talking about the fact that they're nonchalantly printing money. What happens when you nonchalantly print money? You create economic crises. What happens when you let the, uh, the banks uh, run rampant and make their own decisions? You see what happened with the mortgage crisis. Now, there is a point there because you can get in, do your own research on this and look it up. The government is 100% tied to what happened at the banking crisis level. And the impetus of the mortgage crisis starts with the government. It starts at the top. They can't pass the buck. They're the ones that control the banks. They're the ones that control the regulation. They're the ones, as we know, we, we're seeing it firsthand with XRP. They're the ones that, that monitor. They're the ones that approve. They're the ones that give the clarification. That again, they're the ones who regulate. They're the ones who make the decisions on what happens with the banks. And if they don't like what the banks are doing, they tell the banks, hey, you know what? We're no longer going to give you permission to build new branches. We're going to stifle your business or do what we want to do. That happened years ago. Jimmy Carter started it. Jimmy Carter said, if you don't write mortgages to those that can't afford them, you're no longer going to grow. That's a topic for another day. Now, uh, so he continues. Um, let's see here. For, okay, so for example, the Federal Reserve hadn't started printing so much money 10 years ago, we wouldn't have experienced the housing bust or the commodities boom or the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. Eventually, events uh, became a become a uh, persuasive teacher. So now, uh, eight, uh, Hera continues with a line of questioning here. Don't we need a flexible money supply? Steve Forbes says, that's like saying that changing the number of minutes in an hour would be a great tool to increase productivity in the economy. Manipulating weights and measures, whether it's the number of ounces in a pound or minutes in an hour, is a false way to think that you can achieve prosperity. All gold does is serve as a yardstick to measure the value of your currency. So really, again, per our argument, a digital asset or basket of digital assets Having the U.S. dollar or any other fiat currency pegged to uh, a single digital asset like XRP or a basket of digital assets like an XRP and a Bitcoin and, and others, uh, the single digital asset or basket is simply a measure uh, to the value of the fiat currency and knowing that it's backed by something real. Um, again, a digital asset might not be tangible. We can put on our money, but you know what? It's, but it's real. It exists. It's limited. It's accepted by the world right now as a, as a, as a value. It's had a value put to it. Why not turn things around? Uh, but we could take it a step further and completely remove uh, the fiat currency from the equation. Uh, but this argument then interferes with the sovereignty of the nation. So we could say, you know what, we're not, we're not even going to transact in, in U.S. dollars anymore. Remove U.S. dollars from the, from the argument. Remove all national currencies, fiat currencies from the discussion. 
But again, this interferes with the sovereignty of that individual nation. So the U.S. is not going to put themselves in a position where they're no longer uh, in control of their own of their of, of their own uh, currency. So again, the federal government has reserves the right to coin money, uh, but you can still peg the U.S. dollar to a gold or to a digital gold. Uh, so by this standard, it would have to really be an act of the U.S. government uh, to adopt a digital asset as the national currency, which they could do also. There could be a U.S. dollar digital asset currency, but again, it still needs to be backed by something. Um, and so that, that's really the, the idea here. Um, but you know, similar to what we're seeing, again, we talked about the Marshall Islands. Um, with the acceptance of, I think it's the POV digital asset currency side by side with the U.S. dollar, but that POV that it has to be backed by something, um, it can't, you know. And so, in in the same same way around, you know, o overall when we get to the national level, and so that's why we're looking at Bitcoin as an example. Bitcoin isn't, and and it's been shown over and over and over again. The technology is amazing as a store of value, but it isn't amazing as a day-to-day -day transactional digital asset currency but as a, a methodology or a method to then back up the u.s dollar as a digital gold standard it could be amazing uh potentially i'm not saying 100 percent, but potentially or a basket of currencies and we look at the sdr under the imf which is the special drawing rights and they have a basket was it five currencies uh world currencies that are in in the special drawing rights um there's there's so much potential here uh, for what could be done with the digital assets, and we're just kind of scratching the surface. But this goes back to 2012. Uh, this article now, Hera continues. Um, Doesn't increasing the money supply help to stimulate the economy? Again, their thought process. Let's increase the money supply. Let's make more money. Let's decrease the value of the paper that it's worth. From one dollar, we now have two dollars. It's like when you do a split in stock. When you split your stock, if I have 100 shares of stock and you're going to give me 200 shares of stock, um, my expectation is that the price of that stock share per share is going to decrease. Um, but now if I hold a dollar and now you print make $2, my $1 is less valuable now because now there's more of it out there. It just, it, the, whole, the whole concept just makes no sense. Um, so, uh, but this is an interesting question that they brought up. Will increasing the money supply help stimulate the economy again because this is what the u.s has been doing for so many years just print more money pretend to be more solvent it actually put the country more further in debt and there's really no way to pay for government programs as i mentioned before they have two options one option print more money the other option tax the hell out of people and we see what they're talking about in government right now i already talked about that they want to tax the hell out of people doesn't make sense. Now, Steve Forbes says, the only way to increase prosperity is through innovation and productivity. So innovation, what is the blockchain space if not innovative? Blockchain is the most amazing technology. Government needs to get their act together. Government needs to put in their regulation. They have to make sure that they keep the blockchain technology in the U.S. and allow the U.S. to be a leader in the blockchain space. 2012, Steve Forbes is talking about, about things that are so relevant uh, to this space. We can go further back. We can go way, way back if we start digging into, into economics and we start looking at the differences of opinion uh, between the free market that allows for innovation and productivity, or we can look at the government economy that stifles innovation and productivity. It's a very easy discussion to have. Um, you decide where you want to fall in, the, in that space. I'm not trying to offend or insult anybody. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Economy and numbers are numbers. You can't manipulate numbers to your argument. It's black and white. One is one, two is two. You can't manipulate it. It is what it is. So if you're going to tell me that the government is going to do great things with the money I give them, I'm going to tell you based on evidence and fact that that's 100% incorrect. So the government can do some things. There's certain things that we need to pull our resources for uh, to take care of. We need to make sure our roads are good. We need to make sure we build bridges. We need to make sure we have the strongest military in the world. 
those are things that we need to do, right? Now, outside of that, we need to also regulate and make sure that the government is actually doing it at an affordable price. We need to make sure that the government is doing it effectively. We need to make sure the government is doing it, period. So when they tax you and they bring all your tax revenue into one pool, and then they decide, they sit back and say, okay, now the lobbyists come in and I'm gonna decide where I'm going to divvy up your money that we, you just worked and, and slaved over uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And we're gonna decide how we're gonna distribute this money now. We might even give it to other people. We're not gonna create work training programs. We're not gonna help educate people to, to retrain them. Um, we're just gonna hand out money because if we hand out money, if we redistribute the wealth, um, it's just like creating more money. What's the difference? If I take your money that you worked for and I give it to these people over here that didn't work for it, that's a redistribution of your, of your, of your means. That's like printing more money. But why not take and agree, hey, you know what? It's going to really be beneficial. If you guys that are productive, you guys are creating jobs. We have all these people over here that could that are that are that are physically able, mentally able to work. Jobs are training, our jobs are changing, uh, technology is changing. Maybe we need to find a way uh, within the government program or a private program to re-educate these people uh, to help them uh, become uh, more. Uh, hang on one second here, stupid pop-ups. Hang on. Uh, you know, we need to find a way to make them more productive in today's society. We don't need a distribution of wealth. We don't need an overtaxation. Uh, sorry, another rant. I'm sorry about that. So this really just goes back to this topic. And again, I'm not trying to offend anybody. If you have a difference of opinion, that's, that's fine. But again, I'm just talking about it from an economic perspective strictly. Um, so um, again, Steve Forbes, uh, he said, financial in in innovation has been with us for hundreds of years in terms of new financial instruments to meet expanding needs as the global economy becomes more complex. So that was a follow-up. The question there, wouldn't the gold standard prevent financial innovation? So how in the world is the gold standard going to prevent financial innovation? Steve Forbes, and that was his response. No, of course, the gold standard is not going to prevent... How do you prevent financial innovation by making sure that your currency actually has value? That makes no sense. So financial in innovation has been with us for hundreds of years in terms of new financial instruments. I want to underscore this because that's important, that statement from 2012, uh, to meet expanding needs as the global economy becomes more complex. What do we have today if not a new financial instrument? Digital assets are the new financial instrument. And they're here to meet the expanding needs of the global economy because the global economy is super complex. So, I mean, that, that's just unbelievable. Let's see, time check here, 9.08. So, um, going a little bit over an hour. That's what these rants uh, create. I hope uh, people will go back and, and watch an hour video because there's, it's just packed, filled with, with so much important information. Um, man. A financial instrument, new financial instrument. How about a completely new financial asset class? How about digital currencies? I mean, it's unbelievable, right? So here we are, 2012. What's the mindset of this interviewer? Because the mindset of this interviewer is the mindset of these people that are in government right now and, and these others that are, are really trying to suppress our innovation. Has anybody seen what happened in Venezuela over the past 10, 15 years? Have any of these government uh, uh, elected officials, have they ever gone to Cuba? Have they really gone to the streets? Have they gone to Venezuela? I know quite a few people who fled Venezuela because it's no longer safe over there. I know people who are sending boxes upon boxes of the most basic essentials to their families in Venezuela because they can't get them right now because they're not available. I know doctors who have fled Venezuela because it's no longer safe over there for their families. Babies are dying in Venezuela because of this same thought process, because of what's happening in government where they say, let's tax the rich. 
let's take away their right. Let's let's in, infringe on their rights to, to to protect themselves. Let's infringe on their rights to make more money. Let's infringe on their rights uh, to to make sure that their families are okay. Nope, because they don't care. Because in their mind, redistribution of your wealth is all that they care about. So that's just unbelievable. You know, I mean, again, I'm not trying to offend anybody. If you have, if you have a difference of opinion, that's great. You know, this is a bipartisan issue. We're talking about economics, We're not talking about politics, We're talking about economics. We're talking about the well-being of our families, not, I don't, not the well-being of the government. I don't care how much the government gets paid. They're, get, they're way, 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 way overpaid. Unbelievable, really. So, again, so now Steve Forbes continues with this. I'm, I'm wrapping this up, so I, I promise. We're already at the uh, one hour plus mark. Um, and, and if I'm going to continue you know, doing this uh, on a regular basis, I want to have some expectation, at least to respect everybody's time that's tuning in as well. But many of the innovations, and this is Steve Forbes again, many of the innovations over recent years, however, have come about in response to the instability of the dollar and other currencies. Digital assets. Perfect. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, sorry, guys. I, I can't. I can't stand. It. You guys keep talking amongst yourselves. I, I love it. Um, I wish I could uh, do two things at once. Uh, hey, CAK, glad to see you on. Uh, a lot of great people uh, tuning in here. So um, I know I'm probably losing some people. We're going a little bit too long. But again, uh, Steve Forbes. Many of the innovations of recent years, however, have come about in response to the instability of the dollar and other currencies. Maybe he was already talking about Bitcoin at that point, 2012. Um, I'm sure he, he, he probably knew about it, which has increased volatility in currency and commodity markets. New instruments have been designed either as insurance against volatility or to take advantage of it. New instruments. Maybe he knew about Bitcoin and digital assets at that time. If you had stable money, there would be much less hedging and financial speculation. And that's all the economy has become over, over many, many years. You can't point the finger to one individual that's responsible for it. Uh, but I do know that there are those that are trying to put our economy back on track to be the strongest economy in the world. Once again, that's actually backed by substance. Your economy has to be backed by substance. The, the first thing I learned in undergrad in economics, I remember um, my, uh, economics 101 or whatever it was. He talked about the donut theory. And the donut theory is, if you think about a circle, at the epicenter of your circle is, produ is production, manufacturing, all of, all of the, the important aspects of, of the society. And then you have the services and then you have everything else around it. If you take out manufacturing, you have the donut. If you take out production, innovation, whatever it might be. If you remove that, you have a donut, your entire economy collapses. Because now you're, you're just a uh, service-oriented, consumer-based economy, which the U.S. has become for many, many years. And now we're trying to drive uh, manufacturing back. We're also trying to bring and protect the innovation of our technology. So this donut theory was way before the invent of, of, the, before the, invent of, uh, of the Internet. We saw the Internet revolution in the 90s. That's awesome, right? That's a means of, of production. That's not just service. That, that's creating something of value, although it's in the digital sphere, uh, but the digital asset space, blockchain technology is so vital right now. And the US government right now is squandering this opportunity if they don't step up and vote on these bills that are being proposed by amazing congressmen and congresswomen but primarily uh, the, those that are proposing the bills. So anyhow, um, now this next question, I, I promise we're getting, we're getting towards the end of this article as, as we go through it. Um, but the next question I find interesting because it truly shows uh, the need of a government 
to maintain ultimate control over a currency with nothing backing it up and nothing to answer to, control the money value, control the people, right? Here's the, here's the question. I think it's interesting what, he, what, he, what they ask here. Can governments function under the gold standard? What does that even mean? Can the, can the government function under the gold standard? You know, your, your currency is now valued based on something. If you create whatever amount of money you, you want, you control the people because you devalue what they earn. You, you basically control rampant inflation. And again, 50 cents versus a buck 50. That's what the government, you know, uh, does when, when they manipulate uh, the amount of available fiat currency that's backed by nothing. So can governments function under the gold standard? So Steve Forbes says, uh, certain countries feel free to spend money whether they have it or not. Right? Uh, that's, that's an amazing statement. Spend, 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 spend. You know, so that, that's the government's idea to everything. Let's spend more money. Fiat money, which can just be printed up, has disguised the real cost. That's interesting. Again, 2012, fiat money that can just be printed. Digital asset can't just be printed. We know exactly how many digital assets there are or how many uh, XRP there are. We know exactly how much uh, Bitcoin is in circulation. Uh, maybe we don't know exactly because a ton of it's been lost, but we know the max cap of what was there, at least same thing with XRP. Uh, we just saw, I think 26,000 Bitcoins were lost by that exchange up in Canada, 26,000 of them. So how many times does that have to happen? You know? <laughs> Um, so again, he continues, we would never have experienced the kind of government borrowing we've had in recent years. If we'd had stable money, the gold standard would keep the government honest, honest government. Who would have thought, right? That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, this article keeps going on and on. This is amazing stuff. Um, doesn't the government deficit spending smooth over recessions? The bottom line is for the U, uh, uh, the bottom line for the U S is that a weak dollar means a weak recovery. We had a weak dollar for, for many years and we had a strong dollar. It's all manipulated. Stability is good for the economy. The simplest thing to do is relink the US dollar to gold or in our argument, a digital asset, right? Digital gold. Um, now here's, here's really, a, a, this, is, this is really the, uh, the, the top of this argument, right? Uh, Harris says, wouldn't that, wouldn't that tie the hands of the Federal Reserve? So Steve Forbes' response is, tie their hands to do what? Further harm the economy? I don't think that's such a bad thing. That's Steve Forbes' response, right? Then uh, Harris says, how would relinking the U.S. dollar to gold work? Um, and this is where Steve Forbes, and this is, I'm going to wrap up going through this article, but this is where Steve Forbes says, you simply peg the value of the dollar to gold. That's it. So let's talk digital gold. We're going to peg the dollar to a Bitcoin, peg it to a basket of digital assets. It's so simple, right? Let's say, this is Steve Forbes now, let's say for argument's sake, you peg the dollar to gold at $1,600 per ounce. And I believe that's where it had been during the gold standard. I, forget, I would have to look it up. Um, if gold goes above $1,600, you tighten up on money circulation, on money creation. If gold goes below $1,600, you ease up. You let, you let additional money be made. That's how you manage the balance based on supply versus uh, quantity that's being held, supply of, of fiat currency. You keep it around $1,600 by tightening or easing up on money creation. The gold standard doesn't preclude a booming economy having more money or a stagnant economy having less money. That's Steve Forbes. Awesome. Phenomenal. Uh, it's it just so telling. 2012. This seven years ago, he was talking about this. There's so many that are proponents of moving to a gold standard. We saw some of the things he said to me. Maybe, you know, he was aware of what was happening, moving into this digital asset space as an innovative class, financial uh, class being, again, changing because there's so much that needs to happen. And really my point and my point of going over, now we're, we're at an, an hour 20, uh, but the point of going through all this is that there is a good rational thought process for returning the U.S. dollar to being backed by gold. However, gold is not limited in resource. It's artificially limited by production of removing it from the ground. Gold is controlled right now globally by different nations. Maybe gold isn't really the right decision, uh, but digital assets... <clears throat> 
digital gold like a Bitcoin and XRP are 100% limited in quantity. Bitcoin has the fundamentals made as a store of value, a store of value, and not immediate for uh, for immediate transaction. We talked about that. XRP has the fundamentals for being used for large scale transactions and being used as part of the RippleNet solution as well as the Corda solution, which is and will be used by the largest banks in the world and the largest financial institutions in the world uh, for payment settlement and for liquidity. Now. Pegging the U.S. dollar to the XRP would help facilitate a specific set price for XRP. I think that would be obvious, uh, which in turn would help with the uh, provision for liquidity needs for banks conducting cross-border payments and you know overall for the for the price of uh, of settlement. Now, in order to avoid potential manipulation from outside forces that would try to buy up as much as they could of that digital asset. Now, that's not to say that countries out there aren't hoarding U.S. dollars because they are. Our U.S. dollars are being held in mass quantities uh, by foreign companies, by foreign countries. Uh, our debt is being held by countries like China. So, so where, where, where's the argument uh, to say that a digital asset could be manipulated any different than a fiat currency because we're talking about huge amounts of it in terms of value. Only a country uh, could be in a position then to manipulate or maybe a huge number of banks that, if there was some scandal out there, but an individual wouldn't be able to hold enough in value potentially. Um, so there, there's obviously a lot of things in, in play here. Ripple is sitting on a ton of digital asset of XRP uh, that could easily uh, be moved uh, to a government-backed uh, solution for a digital asset-backed uh, USD. So that's something to think about. A basket of currencies and XRP. It could be a Bitcoin, XRP, Litecoin, some of the top basket currencies that are really out there right now that have top utility uh, opportunity. So again, we could we could potentially coin this phrase. I don't know, <laughs> digital gold standard, uh, back in the U.S. dollar by a basket of digital assets. So man, this is uh, this was a great uh, great live stream, and I, I just had so many thoughts to just pump out. I'm glad that you guys tuned in. I'm glad that you guys stood by and listened to some of the rants. <laughs> uh, joining me up for this topic on, on an early morning. I don't know how many from the from the West Coast could jump in. I think uh, CAK, I think you're uh, a couple hours behind, you know, um, but uh, I think with people in, in other parts of the world, um, you guys uh, joined in. It was a little bit later for you guys. It's awesome. Uh, I'm going to go through. I'll wrap this up at the, at the bottom of the hour here at, at 9.30. Um, got some other... Uh, places I got to get to as well. I'm sure you guys do, but let me go through and, and look at some of the comments, uh, questions, um, see if we can come up with one thing to kind of uh, round out the, uh, the half hour here. Um, uh, Brand Boxing says, how much would one XRP be worth in US dollar if it was paid? I've, I honestly, I've, I, I couldn't even answer that. Uh, hopefully a lot. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Um, oh, if it was, uh, I, I think you're, it's you flipped the other way around. If it was pegged to the dollar, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that uh, that I can answer that uh, question, but this is uh, kind of in in that uh, direction. Uh, Rob Cash, uh, we won't have to depend on the Petro deal and war for a strong dollar. That's that's a good point there too. Um, let's see. Let me go through. I'd like to get something. Uh, seems, let's see, uh, Neptune, uh, Ripple have been working with all the big policymakers like the White House for years. Was XRP designed to be the goal? That, that's a great Neptune. That, and that, that's what I've been thinking. You know, I mean, that, that's amazing. You see, if you looked at that interview uh, the other day uh, with, um, with a guy from Swift and, uh, and, um, and Brad uh, Garinghouse from, uh, from uh, Ripple, and and you see Brad sitting back, you know he's just so nonchalant, you know. And the guy, the 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 guy from Swift, um, he just seemed like he was uh, super nervous, 
you know, and, and, and he was stumbling over his words and repeating himself multiple times. Uh, either he wasn't prepared, which happens. You know, I'm not going to discount that. You're in front of a crowd, in front of a camera. You can get nervous. Um, but, yeah, you know, I mean, it could be uh, – but but at the same time, with Brad is just so calm. He seems like he knows exactly uh, the direction. I mean, that's a good uh, you know good vision of a of a leader um, that that he's super confident in his product. Uh, but at the same time, his confidence must come from somewhere. So um, again, let me see here. Five minutes, and we'll wrap it up. That way, we'll kind of uh, clean it up. Rob, thanks for joining. Um, oh, you're at work. I know you, you guys probably got hammered up there with snow still, right? Man, I'm glad I'm in the south. I don't miss the snow and the cold weather at all. <laughs> so um, let me see here. I'm just uh, scrolling back up here to see if there's anything that we can cover uh, to wrap it up. Let's see. All right. I mean, there's, there's tons and tons of uh, stuff that we can go through here. Um, but again, I, I truly appreciate you guys uh, joining on uh, for the chat. Um, I'm planning on every Saturday, 8 a.m. Um, to do a, a live stream, different topics. Um, again, this is Jeff uh, with the, the HODL report. Um, if you guys have any, uh, any specific requests of topics uh, to be discussed on the live stream, I'm still going to put out videos uh, during the week. Um, still going through and really testing out exactly how to, to manage uh, the live stream. Uh, totally enjoying it. Um, I, I love the, uh, the feedback that I'm getting. Um, I hope you guys are, are enjoying it as, as much as I am. Um, and so don't forget to uh, give some thumbs up uh, for the channel, uh, for the video. Um, if you're on and you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe. If uh, you know anybody that needs to learn a little bit about uh, the digital asset space uh, and join in on the uh, morning crypto. Uh, let's, let's get that going. Uh, that'd be awesome. You know, I'd love to see uh, more engagement here. Um, and so let's see here. That's it. I got to, I got to run. So I um, want to respect everybody's time here and I'm just going to wrap it up again. I truly appreciate everybody joining in. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody on uh, the live stream next Saturday. Um, again, throw out some feedbacks. Um, there should be, if you go into my channel, there should be an email um, address there. If there's not, uh, send a comment here. I think I put it on there. Um, oh, one last thing too. Monday evening, I got to get this set up. Not sure how I'm supposed to do it exactly, um, but I'm going to be on the XRP Zoo. I'm looking forward to that um, as a guest on the zoo. Um, that's fantastic. Those guys are doing an amazing job bringing the community together, getting different uh, YouTubers uh, on the video uh, or on, on, yeah, on, their, uh, on their live stream. So totally looking forward to Monday. Tune in Monday. Um, I don't know what time it's at. So hopefully someone on the XRP Zoo uh, could give some feedback, throw out a comment uh, here. So anyhow. Again, looking forward to seeing you guys. This is Jeff with the HODL Report. Last note, I put it at the bottom. Everybody says it. Look, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not providing financial advice. Everything that I say on here is strictly based on my own research, my own opinions. Um, you can do your own research, and that's it. Again, look forward to seeing you on the next video. Until then, keep on HODLing your crypto.